my name is my name is Ann Adams, and uh, I've, I'm the education director for Holistic Management International, and I've been an educator for 30 years, and I've been working in the uh, sustainable ag field for 30 plus years, and and then I've learned about holistic management and have been practicing that and teaching it for uh, 25 years. I have a little homestead operation with goats. Uh, the, there's a picture with the tire house in the background. And uh, so that's been my uh, kind of grounding in how to use uh, holistic management over the years as I've uh, taught it. And uh, I wanted to really highlight that this evening we're going to be learning from each other, hopefully, as well as just me. So I hope we can be very interactive this evening and uh, feel free to to talk with your mouth full if you're having dinner and uh, want to join in and have a question or have a comment. Um, and uh, so the first thing I want to do is have a little survey that we uh, have. Uh, we're going to skip the Zoom etiquette because we figure you guys are Zoom experts at this point and <clears throat> don't need to be reminded about that. Um, Lynn, I'm wondering, should I uh, stop the share or can OK, you can go ahead and do that. So we have a little poll coming up here. If you could just uh, click your answers to the questions about whether or not you have done some kind of enterprise analysis or gross profit analysis before. And if you know how to <clears throat> determine your cost of production for a given enterprise or not. And uh, <clears throat> if you know how to determine what profit you're making or could be making on an enterprise. And if you know how to determine your risk or if you know if you should scale an enterprise or not, make it bigger, um, you know, because of the opportunities. And then, uh, what kind of enterprise you do have currently? Uh, you may have multiple enterprises, so kind of pick your main one that you'd like to focus on uh, this evening. Um, so, if, and if you have any questions about any of these questions, feel free to ask. But hoping to learn a little bit more about. You so I can tailor the presentation uh, to you. You can see that, right, Anne? I can, and I can see that nobody has answered, at least according to what I'm seeing at this point of the, of the participants. So we'll give them a little time to get on and answer questions. And while we're waiting, like I said, if you have uh, any questions, feel free to, to jump in. Feel free to unmute yourself at any time. Uh, I believe uh, we don't have anybody on the phone here, so we don't have to worry about the star six thing. Um, but hopefully we can make this interactive. No, we just uh, passed the start time, so people may need a little time to get back to their computers and get started. We might have people calling in from like the the app on their phones, which doesn't show up the same way, so it might be hard to do the poll. I haven't ever done it that way. Okay, so if somebody can't access the poll, if you could unmute and just let me know. If you have done an enterprise analysis or not, and what your main enterprise is, that's kind of the question at hand here. I'll just give another minute for folks, and then I'm, it looks like there's a chat in here. Uh, okay, so. Okay, so that's a great comment about that their um, operation is not for profit. So we grow mainly for our direct community on the land. Um, so I guess um, one of the things, cause that has, we have had other folks who have um, had that kind of scenario. And one thing you might wanna think about um, is especially if a program is grant funded um, to be able to articulate what is the production that's that 
has come from a particular, you know, a CSA or something that you're growing for the community. Um, how many pounds or tons of food are you giving to the community? So keeping that record keeping um, for, for funders is also an important piece in that. And so I'm glad to hear you're also planning on expansion into farmers markets because I know there's been a number of grant funded um, ones that have moved from, um, you know, totally giving it away to trying to develop a kind of a, um, a hybrid model where they're selling some shares to people who can afford it or a sliding scale of, you know, it's a, at a certain price for this level of income down to free for this level of income and everything in between so that the folks who can pay are subsidizing as well as, as grant funders because the funders sometimes want to see that you're, you're making this sustainable past their funding. Um, and uh, so I'm glad to hear, like I said, that you're expanding into farmers markets. So all the more reason to um, be thinking about, well, what should the price be? Because you don't want the price just to be like, what will get it to sell, but what's actually covering cost of production. Um, and uh, so I guess the question is, what is your primary enterprise at this point? Um, that you're doing for your community or that you're expanding? Is it a, is it a vegetable production kind of mix? Um, that would be the other thing um, that would be helpful to know. So. Um, I can jump in real quick, greetings. Okay. Um, my name is Brother Rashid and I am in Green Mountain, North Carolina. Um, our operation is more on a community land based strategy. Um, we live on the land. So predominantly we are producing food that we eat instead mm -hmm. of um, going into the grocery store. So mm -hmm. yes, we are funded. And um, however, our funders do not require to see um, what we are growing because Sometimes they do come on the land and we share our food with them, we make meals. Um, but I will definitely um, upskill into um, putting it on our annual report so that it makes um, the operation feel a little bit more um, legit, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I mean, because if you're getting total funding right now and you don't need more funding, that's great if you're if your funder is not want, needing or wanting any kind of record keeping. But uh, if you're trying to down the road, get more funding, there may be other funders who need that kind of, of information. So it sounds like you're doing basically a, a whole mix of, of uh, vegetables predominantly to, to feed your, your uh, community. So um, that's helpful to know as well. Um, all right, well, I think we'll go ahead and um, again, if you have questions, but I'm going to go ahead and continue on with um, kind of the general concepts of what we're trying to get people to understand about uh, gross profit analysis or enterprise analysis, um, because this tool has been so helpful in the you know 25 years that I've been teaching there's so many people don't know their cost of production and so that affects pricing like at farmers markets like we've been talking about but also getting clear on like what are the different potential uh enterprises you want to focus on um because ultimately that's what's gonna for most farms and ranches make them sustainable um as they try and do kind of some kind of cash flow and what's also great about uh, a gross profit enterprise analysis is you really only need to know basic math and you can use a spreadsheet, which we have. Um, we have a, a, a financial um, spreadsheet that's free. So if you go to holisticmanagement.org and there's one of the, um, under training, there's uh, free downloads. And uh, under the free downloads is a whole package of a manual and a spreadsheet um, that, does some of these calculations for you, but you can just use a calculator. And you can learn how to understand your basic production costs, which with vegetables, a huge one is labor. Um, 
and um, then the, the basics for analyzing those, those, those numbers, which then allows you to prioritize and make decisions about that information based on your, your goals. Um, and that because holistic management focuses on that triple bottom line uh, of the natural resources, the human resources, and the financial resources, you, you're taking all of that into account as you make these decisions. Um, so just because one uh, enterprise might like really yield a way higher uh, profit, it might also be riskier, or it might be something that um, the, the management team is uncomfortable with. So you're looking at that social natural, or you're, it's really labor intensive and you don't have a good labor force. Those are the kind of things you think about, as well as the, the, the financial bottom line, which is just one piece. So the gross profit analysis is, is, is articulated inside that larger whole of looking at the natural, because or maybe it like really depletes the soil. And so do you want to have to do additional soil building in order to grow this uh, highly profitable um, crop? And, and so those are the kind of things you're, you're balancing as part of this process. And then that's why you're constantly monitoring and adapting. But the key point or take home that I, I'd like to make sure everybody focuses on is how do you focus on profit or effective uh, development of an enterprise? So if you're not profit focused, if you're community based, what is really moving you most toward the vision of your enter of, of your operation or your organization rather than production because so many people uh, producers farmers and ranchers focus on how can i just keep producing more of things instead of saying well what's going to give me the most profit or the most return on the social aspects the feeding of my community those kind of things and so that's a major paradigm shift for a lot of of producers um, and that's what I like to make sure people kind of get as a key paradigm moving forward. So again, as I've talked about this, this whole farm ranch planning system is that integrative adaptive management approach and that you're focusing on these three components. Um, and that's, if you try and do one without the other, that's where problems arise. So what are some management challenges? Because management challenges equal profitability challenges. And for a lot of people, like I said, labor is a huge issue because um, you know, if you don't have a trained workforce, uh, then you, know, you get weeding that ends up like they're weeding the cash crop or the main crop. Um, things aren't planted right, those kind of things. And so that affects production, which in turn can affect profitability. And so knowing like if you do have a profit margin or you're aiming for a profit margin, what is your current production? Back to like, what are your record keeping numbers? And of that, what is your profit margin as well? Um, do you know what your limiting factor is? I've brought up labor because I've heard labor again and again. The other thing in the West is water, is water limiting factor because Ideally, as you develop this gross profit, you actually have some profit at the end, or you, if you're going after grant funding, you know, hey, if we can really address this limiting factor, then we could really improve the production per square foot or per acre or whatever. <clears throat> so you need to, the idea is how do you determine that profit so that you can reinvest it back into your human resources, your natural resources, like, um, you know, how do you get more water um, or some other aspect that is limiting the enterprise? And then also, do you know what your unfair advantage is and how to capitalize on it? So everybody also has uh, that unfair advantage. In other words, what's, what's special about your place that maybe you've got lots of labor um, that is available to you. You've got tons of volunteers, you've got eager. So how do you use them in a way that is <clears throat> just maybe they're not feeling like they're getting 
uh, appreciated or utilized properly and then they're gonna go away. Um, um, maybe you've got lots of water, so much water that you're feeling like, oh my God, we're inundated with water. I wish we would get this water to go away. And yet there's other people that are begging for water. So how do you use that unfair advantage to your, to your advantage? And we talk about a hundred dollar hour thinking because if you're busy constantly planting or fixing fence or whatever, and you're kind of that technician just doing the $10 an hour job and nobody's taking the time to do the $100 kind of CEO, ranch manager, farm owner thinking, then you're always gonna be dealing with those limiting factors and not utilizing your unfair advantages. Whereas if you can take the time to step back and do some of this analysis, you can actually move the operation forward to the next level, which is, um, the point of gross profit analysis and larger financial planning as well. So uh, the gross profit analysis is part of a larger scope of, of holistic financial planning, um, which is again, focused on that triple bottom line, really getting the management team together. So, so for some people, they're an individual operator, but even if you're an individual operator, really utilizing uh, the resources that you are hopefully have, like maybe your accountant or bookkeeper, uh, maybe your bank uh, loan officer or an FSA loan officer extension, um, other people who can help you uh, do that $100 hour thinking because you're doing that kind of analysis. And so the gross profit analysis is focused specifically on helping you analyze your enterprises and assess potential new enterprises. And then the rest of the financial planning is looking at how do you plan that profit up front? How do you define income streams? How do you calculate a cap for all expenditures so that you actually have a difference between income and expense as opposed to many people kind of, well, whatever income comes in, I make sure to spend it at the end of the year. And how to prioritize those expenses and reinvestment like I was just talking about in your operation and then how to monitor your, your plan uh, proactively. So again, we're focusing on that difference between what is a profit model versus a production model. And in the traditional model, you have income minus expense equals whatever profits left over. And oftentimes that's zero or even a negative because a lot of small farms in the US and probably worldwide are uh, in their negatives numbers. But with holistic financial planning, we're saying, hey, how about you plan your income by determining the, 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 the income from your various enterprises, and then you pull out a certain percentage of profit ahead of time, whether that's a dollar amount or a percentage, and everything else that's left over is expenses. And you cap your expenses so that you actually have that profit in order to reinvest back into the business or in yourself or uh, pay yourself better, any of those things. Um, and that, that paradigm shift has helped a lot of people um, make a difference in their operation because they no longer think they uh, just have to take a price. They become a price maker instead of a price taker and they invest in their business, which means they have more assets to grow their business with. And then we say, okay, when you are trying to cap your expenses, they fall into three different categories. A top priority investment, like maybe that water or uh, hiring more labor or whatever. Inescapable expenses that are like um, uh, taxes or workers comp, things that you're kind of obligated to pay. Um, and then everything else is maintenance expense. And the idea is that you try and lower those maintenance expenses in order to free up as much money as possible for your top priority investments. So the way to do this, to create more profit versus just focusing on production is to create profitable synergistic enterprises. And that means, you know, those stacking functions or getting one uh, business to somehow one enterprise in your business to 
somehow stack on top of another enterprise and then tweak your production practices so that you can actually increase profit, which usually means lower input uh, practices. Instead of feeding a lot of hay, you figure out how to graze better so you don't have those hay costs, for example. And then again, investing back in the business and reducing those liabilities, those inescapable costs, debt, those kind of things, and any depreciating assets. Because if you think about all the assets that you have that might be rotting or rusting or depreciating, then hopefully you can get rid of those and increase the assets that are actually regenerating, like maybe more livestock, uh, some kind of, of, uh, of uh, piece of equipment that um, maybe has a longer life, those kind of things. And so the two examples I like to kind of to, to bring this home is the James Ranch in Durango, Colorado. They have uh, operations, so like they have a dairy and they made sure that that dairy operation is a raw milk, uh, cheese, they make cheese out of some value adding. Every time you value add, you increase the profitability of a uh, enterprise rather than just taking the low bar, you know, of, of somebody that's just, you know, the milk truck comes and takes the milk away. They've got direct market. So that's a value add right there. And then they're at value adding products like cheese on top of that. And then they're taking the whey from the cheese and feeding it to their pigs for a whey fed product. So they're taking a waste product and turning it into a food product for another enterprise. That's a great example of synergistic enterprises, value-added synergistic enterprises. And on top of that, they're improving their grazing to reduce the amount of feed. So every uh, gallon of milk is costing them less to produce. Uh, genetics, having good genetics will help you do that with weight gain. Um, those are the kind of things that, that come to mind when I think about the James Ranch. And then the other folks are Paul and Gabe Brown. Um, and again, they've been able to look at, okay, how do we make a low input system by uh, uh, cover cropping, cocktail cover cropping in a grain situation to increase soil fertility, which reduces their fertilizer bill. And we're gonna learn, see some more statistics um, and data from them, but they're able to reduce their cost per bushel of corn, which increases their profit and maintain or improve the yield of the bushels of corn per acre so that their profit per acre is like four times that of their neighbors. So that's the kind of thinking that can really make a huge difference on keeping, on creating a, 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 a business, an agricultural business that is truly sustainable and can uh, follow to the next generation because they've got that kind of business strategy set up. So as I said, this is all part of a larger uh, nine steps of holistic financial planning. Gross profit analysis is step three, planning the income. So let's get into what is enterprise analysis. And basically you're looking at which enterprises contribute the most profit to cover the overhead of a business. And that means you've got any direct income so if I'm cow-calf, number of calves I can sell, call cows, that kind of thing, minus the direct expenses for that, uh, those animals, is my gross profit, which is different than net profit, which is then taking the overhead out later um, to see what my overall net profit is for the, for the organization or the operation. And so if I'm a CSA, then the direct income is the number of CSA shares that I've sold minus the seed, the labor, everything else to grow. Those uh, vegetables is my gross profit. And so again, it's a simple, easy way to look at, okay, what's my risk, what's my scale and what's my profit. And so if you think about those three things for your enterprise, you know, scale of one, like it's not very risky to 10, it's extremely risky. One means it's not very scalable to 10, it's extremely scalable. One, not very profitable, 10 being profitable. Then you kind of start out at a base point of like, I'd really like to get X enterprise to be more profitable because I think I can scale it too. And so that's the kind of thinking you want to do. 
So here's kind of a, a standard example we talk about to help explain the difference and also think about what is your break-even point, where's the risk, and what's the opportunity for scale. So in case one, we have the fixed cost, which is the dark gray area here, it's fixed. So you notice it's fixed because it's straight across. It doesn't change. And then the variable costs or the direct costs are the things that change for each unit of production, for how many CSA shares I sell and produce, how many cows or goats or chickens or whatever I produce. Every unit has a variable cost that is associated with that animal or that CSA share or that acre of crops or whatever, and that changes. Um, and, and then I have my income, which in this case is this line here. I assume you all can see my mouse, hopefully. Um, and so where the break-even point is, is where the income makes sure that I am paying my direct costs, my variable costs, excuse me, my fixed costs and my variable slash direct costs, because variable costs are usually the same as direct costs. And then anything else, the difference is profit. So um, in this case, the direct, the fixed costs are, are $4 per unit. And we're just calling it right there. And my variable costs, you'll notice, don't increase a lot. But if I look at case two, I have half of the fixed costs, but my variable costs are a little steeper. And so if you, if so an example would be like, maybe I have a dairy that I'm feeding the animals a lot. And so my fixed cost of the barn and all the equipment is much higher. But for each gallon of milk I produce, it's not costing me that much more. And then um, in the second case, maybe I'm a grass fed dairy. And so my uh, in investment in, in uh, equipment is much less, but my like labor costs and uh, might be much higher. So in case one, it takes me five units to break even. And in case two, it takes me three units to break even. Now, that doesn't seem like that big a deal, but let's say that in case one, that's 5,000 units versus 3,000 units in case two, then it becomes a much bigger deal, right? So uh, in, the, in case one, I have a lot more risk involved because I got to sell a lot more to break even than in case two, where I have to sell a lot less to break even. But if I can scale it past 10 units or 10,000 units, then suddenly I'm making a lot of profit. Whereas over here, I'm not as profitable. I'm still, I'm still profitable because I'm, I'm profitable after three units in case two, but in case one, I'm, I'm profitable after five units. So that's what we're trying to look at is if you don't know those numbers, you don't know, okay, how risky is this? How much do I have to invest in it? You know, am I feeling like I really want to scale this thing or no, I want to, you know, cause you know, agriculture is all about get big or get out. Well, we're saying not necessarily. It can be small and you like it that way. And you're comfortable with the amount of profit that you're getting. And you don't want that level of risk. You don't plan on scaling. So case two, if that's the case, may be the better one for me. But if you're really wanting to make a big profit, then case one would be the better one for you. And if you don't know those numbers, you can't make those decisions. Again, feel free to jump in with questions or comments as, as we move along. So ultimately, enterprises are saying, what's your income streams? What, what, do you, what jazzes you? Because if you don't want to get up in the morning to do whatever it is, uh, it doesn't matter how profitable it is. It's not going to be the right enterprise for you. And there's so many different enterprises. I mean, there's so much innovation out there. So, you know, explore what it is that you want to do and, and how do you make those value adds and connect with your community um, as, you, as you see makes sense to you.
So when you're planning the income, some kind of basic rules to follow is you can start by projecting your income based on past history or some appropriate estimates that you're getting off the internet. But don't assume that you're going to get 100% of your products sold. That it's really best to like be extremely conservative. So like if you don't have a nailed down market, uh, you might want to even start with 50% of your product being sold. And uh, don't use your best sales data if you do have sales data as the norm. Ideally, hopefully you've got some good years and some bad years and you can use figure out what an average year would be. Because it's always nice to be pleasantly surprised with more income than to be uh, stunned by less income and having to scramble later. And so, you know, ideally you compose, you can compose different plans for best average and worst year incomes if you're exploring like, well, if, you know, like fruit, fruit's notorious for being great in one year and terrible in the other. So, you know, how many years, and, and is actually for the cattle business, you know, in terms of the number of drought years you're going to be dealing with. Um, versus some really good rain years and what the cattle market's doing. And if you're selling to the cattle market or if you're direct marketing. So you, you want to play around with those numbers. And then you can always look at, you know, again, if you're trying to use these numbers in the context of planning income, do you have off farm income that will make up the difference of whatever it is from what you can produce from your agricultural activities versus um, what, what you need. To, to live on. So here's a kind of real simple basic example of a gross profit uh, or gross income, uh, how to do that um, for a ranch. So this is real simple cow-calf enterprise. <clears throat> and we have 100 head of cows, we're gonna call 10% of them. So we sell that, those 10 head of called cows at 300 pounds at 60 cents a pound. And of course you would be changing these numbers to whatever is the situation in your area. And so you get 780 bucks a head with 10 of those. You're gonna sell them in July. You have $7,800 in income from the called cows. Then the reason you called 10 of those cows is because they were open, they didn't produce a calf. So that means you only got 90 calves, not 100 calves. Just because you have 100 cows doesn't mean you have 100 calves. And those 90 calves are going to be, you're going to sell them when they're 700 pounds for a dollar a pound. That's $700 a head times 90 is $63,000. Uh, and you're going to sell them in April. And so your grand total for the year is going to be $70,800. Uh, some of it most of it coming in April, a little bit in July. So you can start figuring out cash flow as part of that. Now, totally different example. You've got a farm and they mostly sell flowers and vegetables. And you figure you're going to be able to raise 100 bunches of flowers and you're going to sell those flowers at $10 a bunch. And you're basically assuming you're going to sell them in July through September. And then you got a separate worksheet for vegetables, which we're not going to get into, but you're going to have a bunch in July, and a couple, a thousand in August and September. So your grand total is $7,000. But you start somewhere with that kind of simple um, math to, to determine what your income is. And of course, your income and expenses are going to be influenced by all these production costs that we've already talked about, like your genetics or your seed, you know, your animal genetics or your seeds, your soil management, your need for inputs, which is huge. Labor is a huge input, as I've mentioned, um, because it affects you know anything that affects planting and harvesting practices or calving and weaning dates are going to potentially affect labor. And uh, so many people say, well, it's just my labor and I'm not going to pay myself, but is that sustainable? And then, of course, your market venues. Are you going to be doing direct markets or are you going to be doing wholesale markets or what? And if you can start thinking about what production decisions are you making that are costing you money or making you money, then you can start exploring how to change those practices um, to make you money and not cost you money. <clears throat> so some other questions to think about is what is your value of production in, or product in different seasons? 
what is the market interested in? I don't know how many people say, well, I know I can grow tomatoes, but like, is there a market for tomatoes? And what are people willing to pay for them? And, and so getting, doing that market research is huge in order to then be able to be able to actually sell them for the price that you should be getting because of the cost of production, as well as what the market will bear. So this is uh, an example of um, Gabe Brown's uh, that I was talking about earlier in terms of his gross profit um, for corn. And he's looking at you know a yield of almost 160 bushels an acre. He's assuming at the time of this uh, that it was 600, I mean, excuse me, 6,048 cents per bushel. So his income per acre was a little over thousand dollars. And then he broke down, okay, what are all the expenses per acre to grow that corn? Well, he had seed, herbicide, crop insurance, the actual planting of the corn, the time, the diesel and the, the equipment, the combining, the trucking and the storage, all $875 approximately, which meant he was getting $855 per acre. And that did not include uh, any direct CSP money or the winter grazing that he was getting off of that field as well. And so his cost per bushel of acre based on his yield was $1.10 versus the US average at the time, which was $4.40 a bushel. So he, was, he could then determine that he was making $5, a little over $5 a bushel. So that helps him get clear on how he can keep tweaking that to improve that, uh, that gross profit per bushel and that gross profit per acre, which was way more than what his neighbors were getting. And so uh, this is another uh, piece of information that, that uh, basically was showing the highest, the lowest 20% of the producers in terms of the lowest profit being made versus the highest profit being made um, for cattle producers. Um, and so one of the questions that really comes up is, could you afford replacement labor? Are you profitable enough that you can step away from that enterprise um, if you need to? Because you could pay somebody 12 or $15 an hour or whatever the price going price is for various aspects of labor um, to help you make a difference. But I mean, that's, if you look at that, that uh, table, return over direct expenses, the lowest 20% profitable producers was only making $130 of profit, whereas the highest were making over $500 uh, per unit of profit which is a huge difference. So that, that just shows you the level of management and how that affects the gross profit. And then they looked at it further and said, well, if you have uh, you know, a tie into the overhead um, and, and the labor and the management, uh, there's also a difference that shows there as well. That was from the University of Minnesota's uh, financial database. So we have a, a spreadsheet a little, I mean, it's a simple Excel rather, it's not a spreadsheet, just as an Excel that, you know, basically looks at all these direct expenses that potentially would be there for, for a producer so that you can easily use it and say, okay, well, what would be my expenses? And start to think about them if you haven't. Um, and, and you can keep it pretty simple. Some people do not put depreciation in to keep it simple. Others do because ultimately you have to look at replacement of equipment or replacement of an animal. And so um, uh, depreciation, depreciation replacement costs are something we have on that. But for some people, I'd, I'd say start simple. You know, look, think back at that ABC ranch, ABC farm ones, and just start simple because it's better to start and do something than to get overwhelmed. Like, I don't know all these numbers. And uh, you, can, you can get more nuanced with your numbers. But ultimately, the question is, do you want to raise more animals? or increase the profit per animal? Or do you wanna raise more product or increase your profit per acre? You know, is there a waste going on that you can address? 
And so this is, uh, you know, the picture, the picture of this, of the little sheet that we have that helps you determine your income and your direct expenses in order to determine gross profit per unit and gross profit per acre. And that's part of that uh, free download financial planning document that's talking about. So let's let's dive into another example because I find that just doing examples and having repetition of examples helps uh, to reinforce these concepts. So this is an example for a B enterprise. So in this case, our income is that we have three hives of bees and they will produce 150 pounds of, of honey total. And we're gonna charge $10 per pound. So we just multiply 150 pounds at uh, $10 a pound, that's $1,500 of, of gross income for that enterprise. And then uh, we look at the direct or variable expenses like what we talked about previously. And we're gonna put replacement labor costs in here as a, an expense. Um, and that can go to us. So if we don't have replacement, we're actually the ones, the management team doing the labor, then we get the 160 bucks. But we're figuring we'd have to pay somebody at least $10. So let's pay ourselves $10 an hour so that uh, we're really looking at what the cost for that enterprise is. And uh, it's for four hours a week for four weeks. So that's 160 bucks. We've got some sugar. We've got some parasite and disease control. We've got the packing supplies to pack it into containers. And then we're gonna amortize our shed and equipment that we just bought to help us have this be enterprise. And basically those startup costs, when you're doing an enterprise and you have a startup cost, it's uh, in this case, we're just saying 3000 bucks, 3000 bucks to purchase the bees, the protective clothing, the honey extraction equipment, the beekeeping equipment, and a we're gonna adapt a shed to hold all that equipment. And we're expecting this all to last 10 years. So that $3,000 gets divided by 10 years of, um, of use for $300 a year that we have to put in for a true cost of production. Now, again, you could say, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna amortize my shed and equipment. Um, I'm not going to put it in there. But if you really want the full cost of production, you would amortize the shed and equipment, and that would be $300 per year that that the bees would have to pay for the shed and the equipment. And there, and so we total that up, and there's basically $750 in expenses, direct expenses. So our gross profit is $750 total for the B enterprise for a year or approximately $250 per hive. Um, so we know, gosh, well then we could, we should have 10 more hives and we, we could then add, you know, that additional $250 times the 10 would be $2,500 more for the, cause I could handle that, okay? All right. So, um, so we were going to do a breakout, but I need a, I'm thinking that maybe given the number of people who uh, we can maybe do this, but I would encourage it. I'd like to, because the more, right now you're kind of passively listening to me, or at least you're hopefully at the very least passively listening to me. Um, and uh, so we're, we're going to do a CSA one. So. If you're feeling adventuresome and you'd like to uh, re uh, respond, I'm basically starting out with the same kind of concept, but this is a CSA now. So you can put it in the chat, but I'm gonna ask you to say, okay, we've got two and a half acres that we're doing a CSA with, and we're gonna try and sell six shares at $550 each, what would be our gross income? Or you can shout it out. And I'll see if anybody's up for it. And otherwise we'll 
will go through this with, with me talking about it. People might have used up their brains today, Ann. Okay. All right. So we're going to, but I'm going to step through this and then I'll give the answers. So basically we've got the, the gross income and now we're going to go to the direct and variable expenses. And again, we're looking this time, not only at hired labor, but that replacement labor. So we've got two positions. We're assuming the replacement labor costs would be like if two people working 40 hours each a week for a total of 80 hours, like the farm management team um, is in there, but then we're also hiring labor additionally because the CSA takes a lot of labor. Reme or, or cover you know, for, the, for the ground, uh, tomato uh, posts, seeds and cover crop, um, the plugs, uh, uh, the transplants, the fuel for irrigation, uh, the, the walk behind uh, tractor BCS and replacement parts, the harvesting and wash tools, the pest control, the fertility costs, because we're gonna truck compost from a, a neighboring farm and the after rise costs. So those are all the things we're gonna be considering. So we're gonna start with the startup costs. So we've got this walk behind, it's $7,000. We think that's gonna last us 10 years, crates, at 1500 hand tools at 500 the shed at a thousand for storing this stuff the garden cart and the pump and those are all we figure going to last us 10 years so we're amortizing those at 10 years but the flexible irrigation hose that's only going to last 500 years I mean, excuse me five years it's for 200 dollars a year so the total startup costs are 1310 dollars and so we're basically saying we assume a 13 10 uh, amortization cost for each year. So we're, we've got $33,000 for our income, 60 times 550. And then we've got our hired labor, which we probably are going to have to do regardless. And then, but here's the good news that if nothing else, we're paying ourselves $19,200 for the season, for a 24 week season. And that right there is like, we're, because there are, I don't know how many producers that are not paying themselves even $10 an hour. So try and pay yourself at least $10 an hour. And then you've got uh, the Rime at 1,000, tomato post at 100, seeds and cover crop, 2,000, transplants at 500, uh, fuel 500, harvesting at 100, uh, and wash tools 100, pest control 200, uh, Fertility costs, the compost 500, and then our amortization. So the grand total for all of those is uh, almost $32,000. So we, we paid ourselves $19,000 and we have uh, a little over $1,000 gross profit on two and a half acres for $476 per acre. So some people get a little discouraged when they see this. But again, you paid yourself and um, you do have a little bit of profit as opposed to it have actually having cost you something. Um, but how do you make it even better? So now we're gonna go to Carrot Enterprise and we're gonna say, we're gonna focus totally on carrots because we got this contract. And we can look at, uh, I'm gonna, Give you the, the answers right here that we have um, we're selling them in 25 pound bags and we're going to sell so many at a retail at at uh, $43.75 per bag versus wholesale which is the bulk of it at 25 so again you you're separating out wholesale sales versus uh, retail sales and this time uh, or we've really increased our gross income of $46,000. Now our labor, and, and I guess the other thing I want to note is you paid yourself $19,000 for 
basically six months of work. So it wasn't a year's work, it was six months of work. So uh, keep that in mind too. Um, but yeah, basically all the same cost amortization. So the difference was because I was able to get this contract, I actually now have not only paid myself the 19,000, but I now have a gross profit of almost 15,000, um, which is a lot more profit than in the other example where it was a little over a thousand dollars. Now, the downside of all this is I have monocultured and grown only carrots. So I'm a little at risk, right? I'm risk it. Instead of having 60 people that I'm selling to, I've got one, maybe 10. Uh, I've got the one big wholesale account and some retail accounts. And so I have more risk, um, both in terms of monoculture and a number of markets versus in my first example. So I've got more profit in this example, but more risk um, in, in this example. So that's, you know, again, information that you got to make decisions about. So uh, again, the idea here is that as over time, as you improve your production practices and your land fertility, as that goes up, then the need for, for um, inputs and labor potentially go down, which means you have increased profit over time. Um, and that's what you're aiming for is that increased, um, decreased inputs and increased in, uh, income through better sales, better markets, synergistic uh, markets, those, uh, those kind of things. And so here's, a, again, an example of what that means that over time as you, like in the case of a cow herd, if you can get more cows on the same land because you're improving your management and, and uh, the number of animals you can run and the profit, uh, even if you're keeping the, the income the same and, and the costs the same, uh, because each animal is covering more overhead or, uh, or the, the cost for each animal is reduced in terms of the overheads. So the amount of turnover that you're producing then your net profit per cow, not your gross profit, but your net profit increases, and therefore the total ranch profit increases over time. And so you're looking at that strategic growth um, that way. And then same thing with the CSA share. It's the same principle that even if, if in theory over time you may be increasing your income because you're saying, well, I need to, you know, the market will now bear $600 a share instead of $500 a share. But even if you can't, that the more units you can produce because of improved practices, um, improved soil fertility, uh, or the way you can decrease variable costs, lower inputs, then each that, inc that improves your ability to have more net profit per share. And therefore, as you improve your market and sell more shares, you can increase your profit per farm dramatically over you know five or ten year period. So again, that's that's the concepts of an enterprise analysis with um, these basic concepts of of really looking at what's your direct income minus your direct expense, and how does that help you determine what's the risk and scale and profit of a of a given enterprise. So I think. That is the end. And if anybody has questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I'd be happy to play around with an enterprise if somebody has one that they'd like to talk about. Time is yours. Hey, Anne, thank you so much. I'm sorry that I was late and missed the beginning. Um, I really liked those graphs that you showed. Can you go back to those so I can see them again? Uh, this, these ones? Um, they were like, I guess it was like a graph that showed oh, uh, yeah. at what point you used like the break, break even, even point and then, yeah, yeah, and profit trajectory beyond mm -hmm. that. Oops, there we go. That was, I assume this one? Yeah, that, that one. That's really, that's really helpful to me. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's, to me, what helps people understand 
and and I, I think there's so much going on in terms of you don't need to own animals or land to be able to to be a farmer or rancher. Um, you can lease land, um, or in the case of farming, you know, I mean, there are people. I just was talking to somebody like from Maryland, and they had leased some land, and and they started um, with like a 40 share CSA, a winter CSA, because that was a new concept in Maryland at the time. And then they've just grown from there where they were able to buy their own land eventually. But um, it's that break even point of like, okay, look, you know, if we're leasing this land for X amount of money, that's, that's a, that's a, a, a might be the direct cost because it's the main uh, cost for the enterprise mm -hmm. um, that uh, we can keep it very, we can, we can break even very quickly because we have so little overhead in our business. Um, now labor then does become, and, and that's the big thing that happens with particularly like uh, veggie producers at the beginning. I mean, they are just working themselves to death because that's the main cost. And eventually they, if they can if, um, invest back into their business, and, and you know, like get that hoop house, uh, get that water system in place, uh, train some labor, then they can actually have some quality of life. Uh, now they're break even then because those are all variable costs, right? Or mm -hmm. Some of them are fixed costs, but at least they now have a, so maybe their break even point moved from three to five, but their quality of life is now a 10 instead of a one. Um, mm -hmm. th those are the, the, the trade-offs. Um, and so usually people start out with a lot of sweat equity, very little fixed cost, and they slowly move up to some more fixed costs and or some more variable costs in labor so they can have a decent quality of life. But, mm -hmm. but really getting clear on what are your fixed costs and your variable costs and how you can change that income trajectory by doing the direct add, the value add, those kind of things. Um, can really make a huge difference for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So you're saying like, it's very important to distinguish between variable and fixed costs because in trying to plan for income, you wouldn't want to overlook variable costs, which will increase as you scale, basically. Yeah, and, and what you can also look at is then, okay, so, because I don't know how many, I mean, big, pretty big, uh farms you know you, you like people are dumping all sorts of and uh, expenses into like these big mixed up expense categories and you're like well wait a minute so is this a is this an enter is this a, an expense for this enterprise or that enterprise or is it truly an overhead so you're like weeding it out and mm -hmm. suddenly instead of thinking they've got this one uh enterprise that's the cash cow they realize that's the black hole that's actually uh sucking all the money and it's because so so really getting clear on um which uh expenses are going into which enterprise are really being uh utilized by which enterprise and and that's true even like with the difference if, if you're like doing a cow calf backgrounding long yearling finishing operation or you're doing even the direct marketing of that beef and you're not paying the, the beef business for that cow mm -hmm. at, the, at, the, at a price, then people are realizing, wait, wait a second, like my cost of production is like a third more than this really good producer down the road. Why am I trying to scale up my number of animals when I should just be buying in from them? Because what I'm really good at is selling them for a good price to a direct market. Or to a premium wholesale or whatever mm -hmm. and that's and i remember talking to some woman who had a um she had a csa but she was also direct selling to uh a um to restaurants and mm -hmm. she had her mix had been like 90 percent csa 10 percent of her income from um the the restaurant sales and within like a couple of years she had reversed that to only 10% of her sales was CSA because it was so labor intensive, kind of a logistical labor nightmare versus how easy it was to sell to this, these uh, restaurants. 
um, that if she counted all the labor costs in, which she hadn't mm -hmm. been doing, which is a variable cost because of all the marketing, you know, setting things up versus, hey, I've got this email list. I email it out to these, you know, restaurants that I've, I've uh, cultivated and boom, you know, I know what my uh, sales are for the week and I just deliver to them and it's like the labor is so much less. So that's where you want to really be clear about your numbers because then suddenly her quality of life increased and her profitability increased because she wasn't have to pay in for all this labor. That was kind of a challenge for her to supervise and keep a hold of and, um, and still get a good profit margin for her overall vegetable business. But by looking at, do I want CSA? Do I want farmer's markets? Do I want restaurant sales? You know, because you have the potential for all these different markets that you can mm -hmm. look at. So um, yeah, it's important to both look at the fixed costs and how you can get them out uh, as or lower them, I should say, um, versus the variable costs, which are you know feed, fertilizer, those kind of things. Do I really need feed? Do I really need fertilizer? Or can I use the animals to do that kind or the crops to do those kind of things for me, which will change the variable cost line from this more to this kind of an angle? You, you want to reduce your variable cost angle uh, so that there's not a lot more being added at each unit. Makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you can you explain to me? It's not totally clear to me. Um, case one, it looks like the space between the income line and the variable cost line, it looks like that is what you're measuring when you're determining profitability. Right. right. So, Same yeah. Order. Yeah. So, so like if we look at uh, that case one, the variable costs on top of the fixed costs are at unit five, that break even point. Um, and it's about like at maybe six or five and a half. I mean, it hasn't risen much by the time I get to 10 units mm -hmm. because the, again, that trajectory is fairly flat mm -hmm. because let's, let's just say, you know, it's a, um, I have my feed cost, but I don't have a lot of labor. And so therefore I can keep it fairly uh, shallow. And therefore the space between my profit line, the gross mm -hmm. income, is, is getting bigger and bigger the further out I go because it's a pretty flat line here. Mm -hmm. And this one just keeps growing. Whereas in case two, because that variable line is much steeper, uh, it, you, you notice it's uh, three at the break even point, the, uh, the $3 versus I'm up to $5 at 10. So it's a lot steeper. Uh, again, may, labor is a good example. I mean, because uh, 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 um, or, or in the case of somebody who's doing a lot of feeding to keep their animals, their cows through the winter, that mm -hmm. might be another example of a variable cost that's causing a lot of steepness. Um, maybe depreciation because of the cow herd that they're, they have could be another huge variable cost that's, that's keeping that, that line pretty steep. So for each unit after 10, you know, they're almost running parallel. They're not quite, I'm still getting a little bit more profit each time, but each unit is not, it's like, if I keep scaling, the, the return on that scale is so much less for me in case two than it is in case one. So do mm -hmm. I really want to push myself to sell a lot becomes the question. So that's kind of the idea of right sizing, you know, in case two, maybe I don't want to push it to, to sell a lot more because I'm not getting, and, and when people do this kind of, of analysis, some of them are finding, you know, that actually that it's, it's an inverse thing where they're losing money on mm -hmm. each extra unit they're producing. And so really why would they want to produce more of whatever? Cause they're losing money on each unit and yeah. feed, feed is a huge one that happens for livestock producers to make that happen. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Hmm. So do you have any thoughts of like uh, what might be fixed costs or variable costs for you that you could tweak to help you increase the, 
your profit in your enterprise? Some, yeah. We at the ranch that I'm apprenticing on, we've been kind of in a um, like a budgeting process mm -hmm. the last few weeks, and, and it's been really interesting. Um, yeah, I think. Like so, is feed is feed on the table is one of those ones to play around you know, with. It it might be. I think I think it, it it looks like we might be able to avoid having to purchase any hay for animals for this and winter. And so, and so, what why, what makes that possible for your operation? Is it because you have more ground? You've grown more grass. <laughs> um, it is because we're selling animals. We're selling more animals sooner. Okay because of of a uh, drought uh, or I think because... because of determining that it would cost us more to keep them and feed them than uh -huh. it would to sell them at a lower weight. Yeah, yeah, and so that's that's a classic example of looking at the marketing end of things. So if you look at kind of that value chain, uh, can you know, can the selling of something at a different time reduce those variable costs? Feed, um, such that even though you have a smaller animal and you might be getting more uh, less gross income for that animal, the profit on that animal is higher because you sold it sooner at a lower weight than what would traditionally or at a different time of year or whatever. Those are the kind of questions that really help people because then what happens is maybe the income line drops some. Mm -hmm. But also the variable line has dropped more. So your profit is actually better than, so don't go for gross income, go for gross profit. That's the message here. So what you just said is a classic example of how to increase gross profit. Yeah, I think it also, I mean, it. I think we are realizing that it's, it also kind of gets back to that like quality of life point that you mm -hmm. made. That, Who wants to feed through winter that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, like, uh -huh. you know, what, <laughs> we could... We could do it, but should we? Right, and yeah, or or do we really want to? And that you know, some people you know changing uh, the calving season so they're not out there in the winter during the calving, but they're and so they the the uh, amount of time, the labor, and the additional effort that's being put um, costs and and time both to to keep an animal alive that's you know fighting nature. That's a huge um, thing that has improved people's quality of life as well as profitability, reduced variable costs as another example. For sure. Can, can you, I guess maybe I'll, I'll let somebody else ask a question. Somebody else has a question. Okay. I have another okay. one for you if no one does. Okay. Well, that was, those, that was great. And great, uh, comments too. Other people though. Looks like maybe you should dive back in. I was going to say there, I think they're saying Shannon, go for it. Okay. Yeah. Everyone's really curious. So my question is, can you talk a little bit about animal depreciation? And I think the reason for my question, just to give you some context, is that it seems like with our direct meat enterprise, it seems like we're finding that there, there actually is a significant interest in older animals. And so I just wonder, like, if the concept of depreciation still applies, if we're able, if we're really finding those older animals to be valuable, and also how how we would figure that out if we wanted to include that mm -hmm. in our financial yeah. analysis. Right. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so the answer is depreciation always does factor in, but the salvage price or the sale price. Um, and, 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 and so you've got a couple of different things. One, you've got like animals who aren't being bred, uh, you know, they're gonna sell at a different uh, versus some that an animal that is being sold for meat versus an animal that is bred. So you've got, you know, kind of the range of, of uh, value on a, on a given, let's, let's say like a cow. Um, so uh, whatever it is that you, purchase that animal for uh, 
minus whatever it is you sell it for as, as coal and the number of years divided by the number of years that animal is in production is your depreciation. So it will change if the, if the sale value was only, I'm just gonna throw out numbers, you know, $1,000 10 years ago and now it's $1,500 or whatever. You know, that's why people who are doing this kind of enterprise analysis are like, you know, they're doing it every year. I mean, some numbers, you know, okay, yeah, we can use the number from last year. No, things have drastically changed. So we need to use a new number in our calculations for whatever it is, whether it's uh, income, depreciation, expense, whatever. So yeah, it's going to impact. So can you give me an example of like, what would be the purchase price on a cow? Uh, a yeah, I guess like for some some of our older cows, like when the meat enterprise buys those animals from the ranch, mm -hmm. then, you know, we're, the ranch is able to sell those older animals for somewhere between a thousand and fifteen hundred dollars. And then in the meat enterprise, they're worth a lot more than that. They end up being oh, worth okay. eight thousand dollars. Okay. So, so you're talking about a different thing because again, the, the beef enterprise gets the 1250 average, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and, and so then the, the uh, or excuse me, the, the cow-calf enterprise gets the, mm -hmm. the 1250. Right. The, the beef production business has the 8,000. So they're lucking out. Now they've got, I'm sure, processing costs and marketing costs, mm -hmm. but, but the 1250, is the purchase cost for the beef enterprise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, let's say the processing would be $3,000 and marketing, you know, let's call it 250 just to round things up. So that's 500, uh, so 4,500 4, as direct expenses for that $8,000 gross income of that animal. Um, so that's $3,500 <coughs> gross profit per uh, older cow mm -hmm. for that versus let's say they get a, uh, they have to buy a steer from the, the, the cow calf crew. Mm -hmm. uh, how much would they get in income, gross income from, from that animal? How much would the, the folks that raise the calf get you mean or the well both both so in other words i'm asking the beef the beef folks how much are they going to sell that animal for in the direct ex direct market world well like i can figure out what our average is right now yeah and just as a ballpark you don't have even have to like would it be around the because they're not is that that animal is not going to be as big as right. the cow so yeah. Would it be half of it? Would it be, you know, $4,000, $5,000? Yeah, probably something like that. Okay, so we'll call $4,500 for a steer versus the $8,000 for the cow. Now, how much are they going to have to pay the cow-calf operation for that animal? Oh, probably about the same amount, really. Okay, so what you just said, basically, and, and the processing costs are going to be maybe not quite as much, maybe 2,500 if we said that 3,000 for the other, because a smaller animal, maybe. Mm -hmm. So, but the short answer is for the beef business, the cow mm -hmm. buying, buying older cows is like way more profitable than buying steers. Yeah. Um, but on the, on the, on the cow calf side of things, that cow, how old, how old would that cow be? I guess she could be anywhere from like mm, three to three to nine years old. Okay. So, uh, so ideally, uh, you know, you, you know, for the cow calf folks, they want to, they want to have hopefully gotten, uh, eight, you know, six calves or something out of her versus only two. 
-hmm. if they're only going to get the 1250 they're going to get 1250 regardless of whether they got two calves from her or six calves from her right mm -hmm. so that's that's the side of things that is going to be more affected by the depreciation of that animal not the beef enterprise mm -hmm. okay yeah that's making sense Okay, because thank you. Sure, sure. Any other questions? Or are your brains fully fried by this time? I would say that to me, again, the main thing is, is like, you know, you just saw how quickly Shannon and I did a really rough gross profit analysis so that we could quickly say, hey, as the beef folks, if we can only sell so much beef, what, what, what I came out of that, that little conversation was, we, as the beef business, we want to buy as many cow, old cows from the cow-calf folks and let them sell the steers to other markets because it's costing me more, my profit margin is much less when I buy a steer from them than when I buy a cow. And if I have that choice, which I don't know if I do or not, that could make the difference of, uh, you know, if I'm even just 10 of them, that's like a $25,000 difference in my gross profit in the beef side of things, if I can make a quick decision like that. Um, so, you know, a, a little, a little analysis, even on the back of a napkin can make a huge difference in, in your, uh, in what your gross profit is. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ann. That was great. Sure. Well, thank you all for joining in. And uh, if you have more questions, uh, I really encourage you to go to our website for the free download. Um, of the financial planning, because that's information is in there, including this graph. Um, and uh, ANNA at holisticmanagement.org if you have other questions. So good luck. Great.